Hi, I'm Brian Timo, one of the pastors here at Grace Spring Bible Church. We hope this resource is used in conjunction with you being a part of a family of faith where you grow in relationship with God and one another. Having said that, we are committed to resourcing our people well, but to do so, we rely on the gifts of those who believe in what we're doing or who have been impacted by the resources themselves. So if you'd like to make a contribution, you can give through our church app or give online. Now, enjoy the word of God proclaimed. Well, good morning, Grace Spring family. How are we doing this morning? <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we are so thrilled to see you here in person at our Richland campus. And for those that I've been chatting with on our online campus, we're so thrilled that you're joining us in that way as well. Man, it's a great morning to worship Jesus Christ. Amen? Awesome. Well, uh, I wanted to get us started this morning by reminding you, uh, we're going to keep on letting you know that we are walking through the Bible in an entire year this year. And that is our journey series. And so we have uh, some resources that we worked really hard to get into your hands to help resource you as you read through the Bible, uh, to help you think of questions about practical application, to give you Bible reading plans, all sorts of incredible information right there in our uh, journey growth guide. So those are available at the hub. I want to encourage you to pick one of those up on your way out if you haven't already. Uh, we're confident that it'll be a great resource for you. Uh, and also, if you've seen the buzz happening in the concourse today, the reason for that is this is the last week of our uh, GS Life Expo for January. And this is an opportunity to help plug Grace Springers into discipleship opportunities. And so that uh, takes a lot of different forms. We have many opportunities for discipleship at Grace Spring uh, we, because we believe that discipleship isn't one size fits all. We, we need a lot of different opportunities. And so we've got men's ministry. We've got women's ministry. We've got small groups. Uh, we've got some mid-sized groups for different life stages, and we've launched um, missional mid-sized groups to get plugged in to different opportunities into the community. And so we've got actually three concierges after service that'll be at the tall tables behind the hub. And if you have any questions or, or you're just saying, man, I'd like to get plugged in, I don't know how, they would love to have a conversation with you. And if you're engaging with us online, we would love to chat with you. Uh, you can send me a message today in the host chat. I'd love to, to let you know about opportunities. Or you can email connect at gracespringchurch.org, and we'd love to get you plugged in in discipleship opportunities throughout our church body um, that happen, you know, during the week and, and all, all sorts of different times. So we'd love to plug you in there. One of the ways we love to worship together here at Grace Spring is through our giving. You know, through the, the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen God do some incredible things in our midst and in the community around us through your continued giving. You know, we've been able to bless uh, different families with, with a lot of food during this time. We've been able to bless people by helping to keep the lights on and, and, and different opportunities and even to, to pour out resources back into us, our church body. I, I mentioned a few weeks ago the growth guides. We do those at no cost to you, but it's through your generosity that we're able to continue to do that. And we're giving back to God what is God's. So if you're here in person, we'd love for you to drop uh, your tithe in, in the boxes as you leave today. Let's continue to worship God in that way. If you'd like to give online, you can do that. Or you can text Grace Spring to 77977. And uh, uh, man, I believe that God will continue to bless you as you continue to pour back what's already his back into his kingdom. Another way we love to worship is through singing. So I'd love to encourage you to stand up this morning. I'm going to pray for us, and we are going to sing songs to our great and wonderful Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being in this place this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come boldly into your throne room with our brothers and sisters, uh, whether that's uh, here in person or, or engaging online, lifting our voices together to worship our great and wonderful Savior. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds this morning as we sing songs, as we hear your word delivered to our hearts by your messenger. Lord, and I pray that we wouldn't leave the same way we came in. Lord, that we would leave encouraged, that we would leave full of joy and, and full of, of your passion for us. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would meet with us in this place this morning. Lord, we give you glory and we give you praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing, family. There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear praise as he hears faith is a 
Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah. out of the top of your lungs.
up your own song to him and thank him for all he's done. for your love. God, may us never grow tired of lifting up the name of Jesus and proclaiming the greatness of who you are and all that you have done for this world. Um, help us today to learn from your word what you might have for us, to have open hearts, open minds, um, and ears to hear what it is that um, you've got in your heart for our church today. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for your gift of your son. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. I started really falling in love with God's Word last year during quarantine when I was really desperate for something to hold on to that was true and unwavering as things just kept changing and a lot of unknowns. I started doing a chronological reading plan um, to better understand the full story of Scripture, the meta narrative of Scripture instead of just small portions of scripture um, that maybe I knew as a kid or that I had jumped around the Bible reading and trying to understand. Um, and I followed a daily podcast that would kind of recap what I'd been reading for that day. So it would really help me understand the cultural context and who are we talking about and how are they related to this person and all of the details that sometimes can get lost as I'm reading through the pages. Um, it was able to help me really understand the story in a deeper way. I haven't always loved studying the Bible. It's not something that I was 
hungry for all the time. I had a really good friend who that's all she wanted to do is just sit down and read God's word. And there was almost this like, oh, I want that. And I actually just began praying for that, um, asking him like, Lord, would you just give me a hunger for your word? Because it is good. And he answered that in such an amazing, truly miraculous way. And as I asked for that, he honored that because I believe that it honors him for me to want to be in his word and want to know him and his voice and his character and see his goodness. I have a quiet space that I go to each morning that is special for him and me. You know, it's that, that shelter that I feel his comfort and his presence um, that has become a retreat. Even in the middle of the day, I find myself if I'm overwhelmed or um, upset about something, that I will pull away to that, that space and just tangibly feel his presence there, which is such a comfort. The scriptures that have been a focal point for me is from Psalm 119, 18, which says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And for me, that's just become, you know, this daily reminder as I'm going to his word, that his word, shows me wondrous things about him and his character, about his goodness and his trustworthiness, about his steadfastness. And I'm able to see him more clearly as I study his word. By being in God's word, I have been transformed from the inside out. And it's not been this, you know, hard pressed tugging and pulling on my effort. It's been an abiding in him. He says that as we abide in him and him in us, that we will bear much fruit and not on my own accord, but because I'm with him, I'm spending time with him. And so what naturally comes out is good fruit. And I've seen strongholds broken and things that were really overwhelming to me, you know, a time ago that he's been able to lift those burdens that as I'm, you know, trusting him to carry the yoke that he's been faithful and he's been doing it. And so I've been able to see um, that he's the one and through his word that changes me. Wow, what an awesome testimony, isn't it? She gave us such a great example of how she allowed the deeper burning yes inside of her to want to become more like Jesus, to put herself aside and pursue him. And that's what we're trying to do this year, is going through the Bible in the year to try to learn more and more, how do we foster a deeper burning desire for God and for his word in this year? And I want to tell you that we've got all kinds of resources out there, as Kenneth mentioned, from growth guides to sermon notes to all kinds of different things to help foster uh, that, that desire for God uh, a little bit more. And so we just started last week in Genesis, and we're going to go through the entirety of Scripture throughout this year, and it's going to be a great journey. Have you ever heard that phrase before? In order to say no, you have to have a deeper burning yes inside of you. In order to say no, you have to have a deeper burning yes inside of you. And it was first said by Stephen Covey, who is the author of Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a great leadership book. And um, I think we all relate to that, right? I mean, especially in January, I'm going to say no to that cookie because I want to get in shape. Or I'm going to say no to maybe sleeping in because I want to get up and spend some time in prayer, reading the Bible. Maybe it's I'm going to say no to hanging out with that old friend because I'm trying to say yes to turning over a new leaf and living a different life. And I think we can all relate to that. I don't know about you, but for me, certainly, um, I find it the opposite to be true all, all too often in my life, where I want to have this deeper burning yes to live for God's plan, but I find that quickly it becomes, the deeper burning yes becomes for myself and how I want to live in a moment. And so I end up saying no to God's plan. And maybe you can relate to that as well. I know for me, when I was in my early 20s, I lived in a house with a bunch of other guys in Salem, Oregon, uh, in this neighborhood. And it was a nice sunny day, and I took my guitar, and I went outside, and I sat on our, our back deck on our hammock, and I just started playing guitar and singing and all that kind of stuff, and just jamming, being outside. And it looked over next door, and between our house and the neighbor's house, pretty close, but there's this little line of trees, and I could see through the line of trees that our neighbors were out there. I didn't know very well, but they were out there as well, and their uh, back deck with some friends, and I was over here in ours. And so I was playing guitar and just jamming out and really getting into it and enjoying it and all that. 
And uh, when I was done, uh, the neighbors uh, clapped and they're like, hey, great job, you know? And, and I got up and I was like, oh, thanks guys. I didn't even see that you were there. Yikes. In that moment, the desire to live for God's plan went away quickly as I was just caught up in the moment of being encouraged by somebody else. And so the deeper burning desire inside of me really was for myself at that point. And I totally lied to him. And a couple days went by and it was just totally eating me alive, you know, in that moment. And so I went over uh, next door. I got, I went over there and knocked on the door and the guy answers the door and he goes, hey. And I'm like, hey. And I said, hey, you know, a couple nights ago, I was on my back uh, porch and, you know, playing guitar. And he goes, oh, yeah, great job. I go, yeah, about that. Um, I said at the end of that, like, thank you so much. I didn't even see that you were there, but I knew you were there. And I just lied to you. I just kind of got caught up in the moment and just loved the encouragement from you. And I just totally lied to you. I'm, I'm sorry for lying. And he's like, okay. And I was like, all right. So I was like, <laughs> you know, did what I felt like the Holy Spirit called me to do. But then fortunately, he just said, so uh, how long have you been playing guitar or whatever? And tried to make it less awkward because I was really <laughs> embarrassed at that moment. But has that ever happened to you? Have you ever lied, maybe, to, to get ahead? Maybe have you ever coveted your neighbor's new zero-turn mower? Uh, you know that you shouldn't. Uh, I know it's great to think of mowers right now, isn't it? Because spring is coming, you know, soon. I mean, you know, uh, March is only like five weeks away. Oh, so that's going to be great. But has that ever happened to you? Or maybe you've coveted your neighbor's stuff. Or maybe you felt bad about yourself in a situation because of something somebody said about you. And so you gossiped to somebody else about them. And what I know about you and what you know about me is we really desire to say yes to God's plan and we really want to live for him, but it's just so hard. It's just so hard in the moment. And today we're going to be continuing our study through the Bible and we're going to learn three reasons I believe it's so hard for us to follow God's plan from the first humans to ever live, our mom and dad, Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve seemingly had everything they needed and wanted to live an incredible life. I mean, God had put them in this garden and had given them everything. And Brian told us last week that God created the world and the sun and the, the moon and created the animals and created all the things and the people and the plants and the garden and all the different things. And they had this perfect garden. It was perfection. They could grab a fruit. It wasn't diseased. It was ready to go. They could eat it. They could grab other plants and things and eat them and enjoy things. They were enjoying the animals. And then Adam was a alone. And so God said, I will create a helper suitable for you. So he made a woman. And so now he had his bride that he gets to enjoy God's perfection. And on top of that, he, they get to walk with God and have communion with the creator of the universe every day. And that wasn't enough though. They just wanted more. The deeper burning yes inside of them ended up wanting more. And so we're going to learn today why they struggled and then why do we struggle following God's plan and there's going to be some really good news today. I'm going to tell you right now up front, there's going to be some really, really good news. But in order to understand just how good the good news is, we have to sit through the bad news and understand just how bad the bad news is. And I know in our culture in the United States, we don't want to sit in bad news all that often, but I'm going to ask you to join me in this so we can truly understand just the incredible um, good news and we'll get there. And so turning your Bibles to the first book of the Bible in Genesis. We're going to go to Genesis 3 today. Genesis was written by Moses. Moses was a Hebrew prophet and teacher and leader. Moses was known for taking his God's people out of Egypt, uh, Egyptian slavery and um, out of that as well. And so he's been known for that. Um, and again, at this point in our story, to give you a little backdrop, again, God had made everything. God had made everything perfect. And Adam and Eve were innocent, enjoying God's creation. Um, and this is where the story um, takes off. So verse 1, and you don't have to stand because we're going to take this a section at a time and go through the entirety of the third chapter of Genesis. So I'll be reading out of the ESV, um, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the, in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden or kind of in the middle of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, God didn't say you shouldn't touch it. 
she just is starting to morph the truth into what she wants it to be. But, um, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So as we read that, I know for me, I'm like, where did this serpent come from? And you look at the first verse, it tells us, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So God made this serpent, made this snake. And so the snake likely was in the garden all the time because they were used to animals getting along with each other. There was no violence. There was no uh, sin or destruction or disobeying God. And so everything was as God had made it uh, perfectly. And so God had made the serpent, but how did the serpent talk and where did he, he come from? Well, remember in school, when your teacher would always say the answers are in the back of the book, but just don't look at them because they're in the back. Well, I'm telling us we can look at them because in the back of the book, in Revelation, we learn that the serpent was actually embodied by a fallen angel named Lucifer, or as we know now, Satan. And so God created the angels, and the angels are up there, and one of those angels was Lucifer, um, who was a beautiful angel, as it says in Scripture, and he, that wasn't enough for him to live just with God and to serve God. Does this story sound at all familiar with what we're studying right now? It wasn't enough for him, and he wanted to be God. And so Lucifer took a bunch of other angels and said, let's kind of disobey God. So God kicked them out and sent them to earth and kicked them out of heaven because they were trying to be like him. And so we know that uh, Satan wasn't satisfied with that and being up there. And so he is now down in earth. And as a result, he is now embodying this uh, serpent and trying to deceive um, Eve through this. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us, and interestingly, Scripture doesn't tell us how long this deception happened. Like, was this a one-time occurrence? Was this happening over the matter of weeks or months? We don't know that. But what we do know is that the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field, and that Satan was able to just distort the truth enough and cause Eve to ask questions to lead her astray. And so I believe the first reason why it was so hard for them and why it's so hard for us to follow God's plan is Satan. Satan's a liar. I mean, a liar. And so, and he will use whatever he can, usually enough little truth in what he says to them and what he says to us to distract us and cause us to start asking questions. You know, people that we are friends with in our life, if they are a common liar and they lie all the time, we eventually start distancing ourselves from them because we can't trust them and we don't want to trust what they say and it breaks the relationship. Well, Satan is so crafty that I don't, we don't notice sometimes what he's trying to do to pull us aside. And so Satan is a liar and he will use whatever he can at all costs to get us to pull away um, from God. And Satan took advantage of Eve being alone. We don't see that Adam and Eve were together in this instance. While Eve was there, he took advantage of her in that way. And Satan, like a fisherman, he baits his hook according to the appetite of the fish. And so similarly, in our culture, where certain sins are a, a more acceptable, that's an easy in for him, whereas other cultures, other sins maybe aren't as acceptable, and so forth. And so he uses whatever lure he can to bait the fish based on our appetite. And Satan didn't come out first and say, uh, eat that fruit. He first started to ask her questions and start lying to her to get her um, to, to move away. And Satan's main go-to that he used with Eve is one that he wants us to believe on a regular basis, that we're just making mistakes. When God says to do something in his word and we don't do it, we're just making a mistake. And so he wants us to believe that we're serial mistakers, let's say, and everybody does it. And so you're just making a mistake. But by disobeying God's law, we are directly acting against and sinning against the creator of the universe. And as we're going to learn, he doesn't take that lightly and neither should we. And so where did sin come from? Sin, sin, the word sin, actually came from a Latin word called santus, meaning guilty. And Wikipedia defines sin as a transgression against divine law. So God at this point, again, there's no Ten Commandments, there's no all of Jewish law, there's not the full canon of Scripture that they they had to obey and follow. There was one rule, don't eat fruit from that tree. I almost wanted to fill this whole platform up here with fruit, and then like with apples or something, and then put an orange in the middle or whatever, and then try to show you how they had to navigate past all of these trees and whatever, just to get to the one they couldn't. And I remember thinking, Eve, what are you thinking? 
Like, why would you give up? God only has one rule. Why would you give up everything and die for something that looks good? And so let's learn a little bit more. But before we do that, I wanted to say that there's a couple of types of sin that we can commit against our divine God. There's two types of sin. One is the sin of commission. The other one is the sin of omission. And so think of commission as basically, as it says, proactively acting against what's stated in God's word. And I like to see of commission almost like committing, things that we're committing. For example, if we're lying, God says don't lie. So if we're lying, we're committing something he's told us not to do. He says, don't have other gods before me. So if we put other gods before him and have some idolatry, then we're committing a sin of commission. If we're murdering somebody, it says, don't murder. And if we do something like that, as well as a number of the other things in scripture, when we do that, we're committing a sin of commission. And then sins of omission is not doing what's stated in God's word. In other words, think of omission as omitting. Commission is committing, omission is omitting. I'm not doing something that I'm asked to do. So for example, when God says to pray and we don't pray, we're committing a sin of omission, maybe not forgiving someone. And especially today's day and age, not living at peace with people as far as we can. It says in scripture, we should be living at peace with people right now. And it's difficult to do that in today's day and age. And I love how sins of omission are described in James. It says this, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. So if we know what we're supposed to do and we don't do it, it's a sin of omission. And so I know the serpent was crafty, but did he actually shove that fruit down Eve's throat? Was it actually his fault? Well, let's go to Scripture and look at the second reason why I believe it's so hard to follow God's plan. So when the woman woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the free, have you eaten of the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? And the man says this, the woman who you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Now, there were no buses in that day. So he wasn't throwing her under the bus, but maybe he's throwing her under an elephant. I don't know. But it's not a good idea when you get blamed for something, all of a sudden throw your wife under the bus or under the elephant or whatever. So then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so again, in this In this uh, point in history, God had one rule, and when they broke that rule, it changed everything. It changed everything. And when they were confronted about their sin of commission, doing what God told them not to do, they blamed everybody else. It says in Scripture, because sin entered the world, Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. See, at this point, Adam and Eve had innocence running in their bloodstreams. And as soon as they ate of that fruit and disobeyed what God asked them to, to do, they now have a contaminant in their bloodstream that has now affected everybody down the bloodline from then on, and that includes us. And so sometimes when people say, wow, that sin that you did or so-and-so did or that crook or that criminal or whatever, that's just so inhumane or inhuman. And I'm here to say, actually, it's not. It's human. Because of that contaminant in our bloodstream, we have an unimaginable uh, ability to create evil because of that first sin. It says in Scripture, in Psalm 14, all have become corrupt. No one does good, not a single one. So the cause from sin is from within. It's not from outside sources. Certainly Satan is a liar, and that makes it really hard to follow God's plan, but sin comes from within. Take a look. Um, oh, excuse me, hold on. 
right here. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself tempt, tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to death, or gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And I remember thinking, as I was studying this, Eve, what are you thinking? God has one rule, don't eat that fruit. But she couldn't help herself. And I'm like, what is with the fruit? You've got all this other fruit here, and you want to go after that one. But it wasn't about the fruit. It was about what the fruit promised to give her. So she was going after the fact that it tasted good and the fact that it it made one wise that she went and chose to eat the fruit. And I would like to say that Eve's cravings blurred her convictions. While she had this deeper burning yes to follow God's, uh, God's desires, this started to go as her cravings started to go up and she was looking at what this was promising her, so she grabbed it and ate it. And as she did, in the matter of milliseconds or seconds maybe, this deeper burning yes that was supposedly there is gone. As her cravings went up, her convictions went down and she ate. And so I'd like to say the second reason why it's so hard to follow God's plan is I love myself most. You know how parents say to your kids, you say, I love you, and the kid says, I love you more. Then the parent will say something like, I love you most. And in this instance, she loved herself most. And I think for our lives, we love ourselves most. And the feelings we have at that moment when we're looking at something or when we're, we're tempted with something that we, that we shouldn't do, that God has asked us not to do, we have real feelings going on. Those feelings that we have are real. I'm just here to tell you that our feelings are not reliable. Our feelings are real, but they're not reliable. And I almost like to say as our feelings or cravings go up, our convictions uh, go down, and we start believing that we deserve it. We start believing like, hey, I've done this before, or other people have done it. This isn't like a diet, for example, that it's like, I'm going to start tomorrow, so I'm going to eat whatever I want today. You know, and I'll be honest with you, I think as Christians, sometimes we're like, hey, we know we're going to heaven, and so, like, what's, what's another sin? Sin is graphic, and sin has incredibly deadly consequences, as we're going to learn in just a minute. I love what the Apostle Paul says. Here he says, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Again, this contaminant within our system is causing us to sin. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, For I have the desire to do what is right. I have this deeper burning desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. There's a lot of do's and do nots in that whole thing. But basically what he's saying there is that I want to follow God. I have this desire to follow God. But in my flesh, it's weak. And this contaminant, in a sense, is causing me um, to do what I don't want to do. So Satan is certainly a liar and a deceiver, but we also love ourselves most. And so there's a third reason that I believe it's so hard to follow God's plan. And let's go back to Scripture. In verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this. So again, God looked at Adam and was like, hey, man, what's up? You just did what I told you not to do. And then he's like, the woman. And so he looks at the woman. He's like, hey, you just did what I told you. And she's like, the serpent. And so now God is directing his, his conversation directly to the serpent. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, a sense brought her astray, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field, On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all of the days of your life. Now, scholars in this might think that it was possible the snake might have walked before that or something. Uh, We don't know. But at this point, God is saying, now you'll be on your belly, slithering through the dust 
all of the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is a foreshadowing right here in Genesis about Jesus. Look at that again. He shall bruise your head. He, talking about her offspring, will bruise your head. It says in the NIV, will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. In other words, from now on, that snake is going to be biting at our heels while we're alive and here on this earth. And then eventually Jesus will crush his head. Right in Genesis, we hear about Jesus And then to the woman, so that was his punishment. To the woman, he says this, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Thank the Lord that I've never personally had kids. Holy cow. But my wife, I've been in there four times when we've had our four kids, and there's a lot of pain there. And when I try to say, no, I don't know if we need the drugs, that's not a good idea. So there's definitely pain in childbearing. You desire, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And then he says to Adam and directing to Adam, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field. So he's basically saying, I have provided everything for you. You have literally low-hanging, perfect, undiseased fruit and vegetables and everything you can eat in the garden. And from now on, you're going to have to work the ground and there's going to be weeds in the garden. And I know Julie Vandervoort over there is not looking forward to weeds in about three months when she starts a garden. God keeps his word. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember what it says, what it said last week, that God took up some dust and breathed life into the dust, and out of the dust Adam came. And he's saying here now in Scripture, you are going to return to the ground. Because of you disobeying me, you are going to go into the ground, you will die. God is just, and there's going to be a penalty for our sins. He can't just be in the garden anymore. They have to now sweat and work the ground and sweat and and have pain through childbirth. It's so hard to follow God's plan because Satan is a liar. It's hard to follow God's plan because I love myself most. And the third reason I believe it's hard to follow God's plan is that we never think of the consequences. We never think of the consequences. I don't believe when Eve was there grabbing that fruit, certainly her her cravings started to outweigh her convictions and the deeper burning yes for God drifted away as her feelings went up towards whatever this was promising her. But I don't think she thought of the consequences of how the world will forever be changed until Jesus comes back. Sin hurts. Sin has consequences. And when Adam and Eve ate that fruit, It was the darkest day in the human race. It was the darkest day in the human race because now there's a contaminant in their bloodstream that's going to cause violence and evil in the world of which we're living today. Creation as God made it is completely changed. And now for the rest of our time on this earth, we're going to have our heels bitten by the serpent until Jesus comes back and crushes his head. And I'm looking forward to that, crush that guy's head. And similar to how Adam and Eve didn't think about how bad things were going to get for them because of their actions, I don't think we think of the consequences of our sin on this earth and for eternity because of it. And so let's finish the text and understand some of these final consequences. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So he's basically um, killing animals and taking those uh, skins. Uh, Troy is here today. He's an animal trapper. But uh, they, they killing, killing animals and using the skins because when they were using fig leaves for loincloths, that's not very uh, comfortable or warm. And so God is, is doing that for them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, 
and knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim or a couple of angels and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the tree of life. And so here God is saying, this is my perfect garden. You no longer have innocence in your blood. You now have a contaminant in your blood. You're now sinful beings. I will not have that in my garden. You are out. And then he put two angels there. And I picture angels of like nine feet tall, muscle-bound, bouncer kind of guys with the, the sword going every which way that there's not a chance Adam could get back in and grab fruit from the tree of life, which provides eternal life. In other words, you are going to die because of your sin. And I will not have sin in my presence. I am a just God. And so there might be people out there, whether in this room, or maybe you're watching online today, or maybe you're watching um, later on this week, and maybe we think that when we die, God is going to look at our life and say, yeah, you know, you went to church, or yeah, you took care of poor people. Yeah, you lied, but yeah, you did this, or yeah, you did that. I mean, God is saying, basically, that's a hard no. That's not going to work in my house. Because of your sin, whatever your sins are, and all of us are fallen, as we learned, we will not be able to enter in. Our sin, excuse me, sinful self will not be able to enter in into his garden. And he's sharing with us a foreshadowing of what that means in heaven. And so I said at the beginning, in order to understand just how good the good news is that we're going to get to, we have to understand just how bad the bad news really is. And so no matter who we are or what we're going to try to do or whatever we've done in life, our sin is it, 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 that God weighs that and says it's sin or it's not sin. And there was only one person that didn't sin and lived a perfect life, and his name is Jesus. Just like God is full of incredible justness, he is also full of incredible grace and love and mercy for us. And God demonstrated that by having a deeper burning yes for us. God had a deeper burning yes for us, so he sent his only son, his only son, he sent to the earth, who lived a perfect life, who didn't have any sin, who wouldn't have gotten slashed by the flaming uh, sword because he would have been let in because he, he didn't have sin. So God is welcoming him in and he lived a perfect life and he took on your sins and my sins and the sins of the world on his back. And while he was on the cross, dying one of the most graphic, horrific deaths that a person can experience, God watched every detail of his only son dying on the cross because he has a deeper burning yes to say, no, I'm not going to save you while you're crying out to me because I have a deeper burning yes for us. And I want us, I want my people to be with me in heaven. And so that penalty that you paid on the cross after living your perfect life now takes the place of the penalty of everyone else who has sinned. It says in Romans, for it is by one man's disobedience that many were made sinners. So in other words, by Adam's disobedience, by Adam and Eve's disobedience, many were made sinners. But by one man's obedience, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. So Jesus passed through that for us, took the sword for us. And when his body, his flesh was cut open for us, the veil between God and us was torn from top to bottom to signify there's a new way to get to God and it's through me, Jesus Christ. And Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you're out there right now, you're watching us here on the Richland campus or you're online, come before God right now and say, I'm a sinner 
and I know that I deserve death. I have fallen short of your perfect plan, and I deserve to die. But I believe that Jesus and his perfection and his perfect life took on my sins on his back and died so I can live with you. I'm sorry. And you say that to God, and it says in Scripture that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all the unrighteousness in our life. And what's so awesome is during the first service, we had two people trust Jesus for the first time. And I'm telling you right now, whether you're watching online or whether you're in this room, what are you waiting for? If you're somebody that, that is thinking that your good is going to outweigh your bad or everybody goes to heaven, that is not the truth. The truth is that I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus has died on your behalf, paying your sins with his perfect life, that once you die your earthly life, you will experience eternal life with him. And so I'd encourage you right now to click that button online that says, I commit my life to Jesus, or send us a message on Facebook. Our team right now is standing by and would love to talk with you. For those of us who call ourselves Jesus followers, isn't this good news? Man, do we need it. I know hearing the raw, unfiltered gospel reminds us of just how helpless we are without him, doesn't it? And I will hear to say that while we have a conviction to follow Jesus, while we have this conviction, it's not this conviction that's going to keep us from sinning. It's not this conviction that's going to keep us there because that'll go away as our, as our cravings go up. So as our cravings for something goes up, our convictions are going to go down. The only way is through our connection with our Father through Jesus the connection with our Father, going to the Father and sitting with Him is what will restore our heart, what will right our wrongs through Jesus. And so my question for you is, how are you doing with your connection with our Father? Because as we spend more time with our Father, we realize how amazing He is and how not amazing we are. And so I'm going to give us just a few minutes of a gift right now in the service of just spending a few minutes with your Father and confessing your sins to him and saying, God, this is where I've fallen short and I need Jesus and thank him and just sit for a minute and be enveloped by his incredible mercy and grace and love for us. And then the band is going to lead us in a song and I want to read these words to us that we're going to sing together. And I know I don't deserve this kind of love. Somehow this kind of love is who you are. It's a grace I could never add up to be somebody you still want. But somehow you love me as you find me. God loves us as we are, not as we should be. Because we know how we should be. But God loves us right where we are. And so I'm going to give you a few minutes and if you're online, this is not the time to turn this off. If you're working out right now on a Thursday, spend a few minutes right now with your Father and just thank Him for the incredible good news of Jesus.
I've been strong and I've been broken within a moment. I've been faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I've held everything together and watched it shatter. I've stood tall and I have crumbled in the same breath. I have wrestled and I have trembled towards surrender. Chased my heart adrift and drifted home again. Plundered blessing till I've been desperate to find redemption. And every time I turn around, Lord, you're still.
about what hope we have to build our life on Jesus, right? Wow. What hope we have to build our life on Jesus, right? Yes, we've got incredible hope in Jesus. And as we think about this week, and we think about why is it so hard to follow God's plan, one is because S, Satan is a liar. I, I love myself most. And N, for sin, we never think of the consequences. And it's only through a connection with our Father, through Jesus Christ, that redeems us. And we're so thankful for that. And I want to share with you as well, I just got a report just a minute ago that two more people just trusted Christ during this service. Absolutely amazing and awesome. And so as you leave, let me pray, pray a prayer of blessing with you. I want you to look up this way. And we're actually going to do an eyes open benediction. Now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Have an awesome week.